My dad, my mom, want to invest in a deal I'm doing. Is that a JV? Is it a syndication? Hey, you know, you get 20%, you get 20%. Uh, let's just agree to that. Is that, is that good enough? Hello, I'm Kathy Betke. I'm a co-host of Bear Pockets on the Market. And today we're going to be talking about JVs. That's joint ventures. It is part of the whole OPM idea, using other people's money to fund your deal. But people confuse joint ventures with syndication or just thinking that rules don't apply to them. You got to do it right. You've got to do it legally, which is why we have an attorney here with us today, Mauricio Raul. Mauricio is a syndication attorney and has helped many, many investors be able to build much bigger portfolios by using other people's money. And the other people are investors who would like a return. So it's a win-win. So let's start with joint ventures because... People confuse joint ventures, right? You're saying yes, yeah. Yeah, yes. with syndication or um, just thinking that rules don't apply to them. Would I, did I suck that up? Here, do you, so one of the biggest issues that we're having right now is people trying to make or do joint ventures and trying to avoid securities laws and not realizing that they're actually issuing securities and have to follow the securities laws. So they just believe that, hey, I'm going to structure this as joint venture. I don't have to worry about all those nonsense and evil things over there, but the reality is that you don't get to make that decision, right? Like it's either a joint venture or it's a syndication of securities offering. You'll get to make that choice. It is what it is. And it, it all comes down to whether you have passive investors in your deal. If you have a passive investor, even one, then now it's going to be a securities offer because the definition of the security is essentially anytime you're taking money from investors where the returns are generated by your efforts, you're doing all the work and your investors are simply cutting you a check. That's the textbook definition of a security. So let's take some typical scenarios where this might come up. My dad, my mom want to invest in a deal I'm doing. Is that a JV? Is it a syndication? It depends on the roles. If they're just writing you a check and then going home and sitting on their couch and, and receiving the income and you're doing all the work, that is a securities offering. But it's my mom and dad. There's y'all and no friends and everybody asks me that. There's no friends and family and girlfriend or spouse. There's no distinction under the securities laws. It all comes down to, are you doing any work? Are the returns being generated by you and your mom and your dad? as your, when your brother or are you doing all the work? And if you're doing all the work, that is a textbook definition of a security. Okay, so let's just assume then in a joint venture that everybody's doing the work and we say, mom, you're going to have to do the accounting, dad, you're going to have to paint the house, I don't know, something, and everybody's doing some yes. Then how do you structure a deal like that? Typically, if we're talking real estate, generally most joint ventures are set up as a limited liability company, an LLC. So generally we would create that entity, we would hold title to the property in the LLC, and then the LLC would have owners, what we call members. And so some percentage would be owned by you, and some percentage would be owned by your mom, from your dad, from your brother. So whatever those percentages are, which typically correlates to the amount of money everybody has put into the joint venture. Now, can I just say, uh, hey, you know, you get 20%, you get 20 for and uh, let's just agree to that. Is that was that good enough? That's probably not. <laughs> 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 not a picture of your parents, you have your friends, and then I know you want to have this document. Obviously, uh, an LLC is a legal a legal entity, but you actually file with the state, and then you create something that's called an operating agreement. And so, in that operating agreement, which are basically the rules and the regulations of that entity, that's where everybody's roles and responsibilities will be outlined, what their compensation looks like, who's doing what, and that's a very important document that you want to make sure you have in your files. Now, can you do a JV without an operating agreement or without forming an LLC? You theoretically could, but you're always going to be drafting some sort of a document. So, for example, another way you could structure that is through direct ownership. You know, you could have four people, right? You, your mom, your dad, your brother, they, you guys could each own 25% direct ownership in the property, and that's what we call a tenant in common. And so you, if you actually pull title from the property, you would see four people's names on title. And then generally there's a written agreement called a tenant in common agreement, a TIC agreement, which is very similar to an operating agreement. It's just there's no LLC in that scenario because you decided to structure it as a tenant in common, which I generally don't recommend just from a pure asset protection standpoint, because if something does happen to the property, then the owners are legally responsible. And it's much better to have the LLC be the owner, which limits your life liability as opposed to having individual owners that they can to market. Okay, so what are the most important things, let's say the three most important things to consider if somebody wants to do a deal together? And I'm imagining this happens a lot. People probably are doing it wrong a lot and you're coming in and having to try to fix it. <laughs> yes. If you want to do a legitimate 
joint venture, the first thing I would say is number one, keep it to less than five people. Oh. If you have seven, 10, 20 people in this joint venture, it's going to be very difficult for you to show that everybody was actively involved. The SEC has kind of put that number around five. So number one, keep it under five. Number two, make sure that there's no ringleader, that there's no person's really running the show or doing most of the work. Make sure that everybody is contributing to the returns of that investor. And number three, make sure that in that document, whether it's an operating agreement or a tenant to common agreement, everybody has the right to vote, especially on the major decisions. Everybody has their proportional rights because that's really what dictates somebody being active versus passive is do they have that ability to vote to sell the property or hire a property manager or get a refinance or some of those major decisions you want to make sure all of the members have equal voting rights or proportion, I should say proportional uh, voting rights to what's in the documents. And I would guess number four would be make sure you have an attorney drafting the agreement. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm a little bit biased, but you never want to have some sort of legal document drafted by yourself or even some of those uh, outfits that aren't necessarily law firms. So yes, have an attorney draft that for you. That's usually a real estate attorney that would put that together for you. It shouldn't be that expensive, but an ounce of prevention goes a long way. Just spend a little bit of money on the front end as opposed to on the back end when things don't go as planned. How much can you expect to spend on that? You know, a group of real estate attorney is probably, they'll charge you by an hour. So they're usually 250 dollars an hour, I would say, is something reasonable. It might just take them two or three hours to put that together. So maybe $1,000 or $1,500 total. And obviously, you want to split that between all the members. And can you use that same document for your next deal? Yeah, it's a bit similar if it's the same percentage, the same, same rules of responsibility. Sure. Now, the minute you have a new member or somebody leaves, that's a bit different. I'd probably have the attorney review it. But yeah, the, the nice thing about a tree is that you can just have to put together that, spend the money initially to put that main template together so you have all the legal stuff. And then if it's just percentages that are changing or distributions, you can then just kind of change those numbers yourself. So is a JB deal like that regulated by the SEC or the DRE, Department of Real Estate or Securities Exchange Commission? If it's a true joint venture, then it's outside of the securities realm, which is why people want to do joint ventures, because once it becomes a security, then you have all the rules and regulations of securities, and that gets really, really expensive. And so if you do a proper joint venture, it's no longer a security. It's not regulated by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, or the state regulators. Uh, it's not really regulated by real estate because you're not really dealing with a, a purchase and sale of a, of a real estate. So it's really just contractual law. It's really contract law at that point that governs, and it's going to be generally your state contract laws that better apply. So then you don't have to file anything. You don't have to file anything other than if you're doing the LLC, you want to file the formation of the LLC. There's nothing to report, no, nothing to, to file or report to. Again, yeah, just making sure, probably the most important thing is just making sure that you're not crossing that line where you're going from a joint venture to a securities offering. Because once you cross that line, that's when you get into trouble because you're not following securities law. So if you're going to use an attorney, one of the things that they can do is, is guide you in that. It's like, is the structure that I have right now, or if there's a, a new one in the future, is that going to be something that I'm still considered a joint venture? Or did I change it to the point where now it's securities offering? Because that's something, again, you don't get to make that decision. You want to have a professional analyze that for you so you don't get any trouble. Now, uh, you're not supposed to actively solicit investors on social media or at events for a syndication until it's been filed and has to be filed a certain way to be able to do that. What about with JVs? So again, joint ventures are not securities offerings. So if you are want to go on social media or advertise the fact that you're looking for a legitimate partner to bring in in order to help you, then you can definitely advertise seeking that individual. But again, you want to make sure that they are a legitimate partner and not a, just an investor who's giving you money. So for example, a great example would be maybe you want to buy a piece of property, but it's, you know, it's a little bit too expensive for you. And, you know, you can only come up with a third of the money. Well, maybe you can find two other partners with the other two, but the three of you are going to be doing the actual work. Wow. Okay. Well, there it is. The difference between a JV and a syndication. In my next video, we're going to talk about doing a syndication. All right. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for joining me here on your market with bigger pockets, but uh, presented by Fundraise.